So uh, smaller crowd tonight, bit of a smaller turnout than we've had the last couple of meetups, but um, lovely to have all of you here. Uh, I am Lindsay and my co-organizer, Mick, or Michael might be uh, lurking around somewhere in the background trying to get in, I don't know, but uh, for me it's now, well for now it's me. Um, before we uh, kick off, I want to do uh, an acknowledgement of country. Uh, so we acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia, uh, which in my case is the uh, Gurindai people, uh, and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. Uh, we pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. So uh, thank you all for, uh, for coming along this evening. Welcome to the uh, to the August meetup. Uh, quick refresher on our code of conduct. We've been doing this online now for uh, for a couple of months, but it's worth being clear that the uh, the same code of conduct applies uh, online as it does in our face-to-face -face meetups. So we don't tolerate harassment of meetup participants in any form. Um, we expect that all communication here is appropriate for a professional audience. Um, and yet uh, harassment and sexist, racist or exclusionary jokes are not appropriate for uh, the DevOps Sydney meetup. Uh, and yeah, because we're on Zoom, it uh, makes it pretty easy to uh, to kick folks if that uh, if that's necessary, but I'm hoping that we won't have anything like that happen. Right, so tonight's agenda, uh, we are gonna do a, an intro, which is actually a thing that I'm doing right now. Um, then we're moving to a main talk. We've got a quick events and job section and then uh, some lightning talks. Well, in fact, one lightning talk to me. So our, uh, our main talk for this evening, we've got uh, Bobby from AWS talking about CICD for robotic development with AWS RoboMaker, which I'm definitely looking forward to. Um, we've also got our, our job section in the middle. So I'm just sort of priming people a little bit ahead of time. Um, so if, you've, uh, if you're looking for work or uh, looking to fill a position, uh, you're going to have 30 seconds there, so um, definitely let me know ahead of time. Just uh, pop open the chat, that, uh, the chat at the bottom of the of the Zoom, and uh, type a message through, just so I know that I can call on you when the time is ready. Uh, and the the lightning talk that we're going to have after the events and job section is Brent uh, talking about the AWS Global Accelerator. Bit of a, a smaller session this evening, but uh, nice and small and intimate with uh, you know 15 of us here, so that'll be nice. Um, so, uh, given that it's a smaller meeting and we can we can all be uh, uh, less uh, inhibited about coming forward, who here is a first timer to the meetup tonight? Feel free to, uh, to unmute to say so. Oh, there's somebody that's put up their hand. That's very nice. Thank you, Martin. Anybody else who wants to put up their hand as being a first timer? I'm sure there are a few. And uh, I'm curious to hear how far away you've come from. And do we have any out of staters here? Anybody that's uh, that's out of New South Wales? Germany. <clears throat> Germany. Germany. Amazing. Almost on the other side of the uh, the planet. Do we have anybody further than Germany? Anybody from I don't know, roughly Portugal or the UK? In the Netherlands. I'll settle for the Netherlands. Very good. Well, Martin, it looks like you've uh, won the prize of the uh, furthest person that's come. I, I'm sure it, it was quite a hard trek getting all the way over here. Those those packets have got a long distance to travel. So um, lovely to have you with us. Awesome. All right. Well, let's just roll straight into it then. Uh, we're going to do our first talk, which is uh, Bobby talking about CICD for robotic development with AWS RoboMaker. I'm going to release the screen and um, in fact, I don't even have the screen at the moment because I'm trying out a new presentation software. So there we go. Bobby, over to you. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, you're able to hear me okay? He just fine. Awesome. Um, so I will try and work out how I'm going to do this. Uh, let me just see if I can share my screen appropriately. Whoops. Wrong one. Switch. Uh, I cannot remember how to switch over. Does uh, X on the keyboard work? Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's this. all good. Cool. Very so good. you guys can see the uh, the main screen. I'm assuming. Can see and hear it really well. Thanks, Bobby. Awesome. 
Okay, so uh, thanks for having me uh, this evening uh, or morning, uh, wherever you may be, especially in Germany. Um, I, I'd say that I'm probably responsible for the lower turnout. It is a bit of a niche topic. Um, hopefully, it should be an interesting one for those of you attending. Um, you know, it's a bit of a, a technologist's one uh, for, for folks that might like to tinker. Um, so as Lindsay mentioned before, uh, my name is Bobby. I'm a solutions architect uh, in Sydney for Amazon Web Services, uh, and I specialize in robotic development on the AWS platform. Um, now, uh, for, for a lot of folks that are unfamiliar with, with robotic development, um, that may seem a bit strange, uh, especially when you know, you're sort of familiar with robots being potentially Boston Dynamics uh, spot robot. It's a piece of hardware that essentially uh, interacts with the physical world around it. Uh, and so for a lot of folks, they, they tend to ask me, you know, what, what does the cloud have to do with robotic development, considering it's uh, such a, a hardware-focused um, sort of landscape? And to be able to better understand that, what I usually like to do is sort of just quickly address some of those robotic development challenges. So for Roboticists uh, or robotic developers or enthusiasts, you might be quite familiar with some of these difficulties or challenges. Um, but these are sort of what, what really uh, can cause uh, quite a bit of uh, difficulty with or you know, um, challenges with getting started with robotic development. So certainly there's a high entry cost for robotic hardware. And that's, uh, you know, if we're, if we're talking about a robotic arm, for instance, an entry level robotic arm, Usually you're looking at about 10,000 US dollars and that's just very entry level, very light payload. And then you're sort of working your way up to six figures. And uh, for those of you that are familiar with deploying code and uh, development code into production, uh, you know how risky that could be. Uh, it's the same sort of thing with deploying to robotic hardware. Uh, you have a chance of you know, getting that, that shoulder joint angle incorrect, you know, putting a, a minus in front of the angle where it shouldn't be and uh, it going 180 degrees the wrong way and sort of slamming that gripper into the ground and breaking it into a thousand pieces. That can be quite an expensive, uh, expensive test uh, for development code. And then obviously there's hazards involved as well. If we're starting to talk about uh, an industrial spec robotic arm, uh, we're potentially talking about something that, you know, once again, if you deploy code incorrectly to that robotic arm, uh, it could uh, have uh, results that you would not expect. And if there's anyone nearby, um, you know, it could, it could cause some serious damage. And that's the same with autonomous drones, autonomous vehicles, certainly a lot more damage uh, and a lot more risk there, something that you definitely want to avoid. Um, there's a lot of iterative testing to get it right. Uh, if you think of commercial robotic, uh, robotics, so for instance, uh, robot vacuum cleaners, or even when we're talking about uh, things like the Mars rover, um, certainly you want to get that as right as possible in multiple different scenarios uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, when you finally do release to production, you've got the best chance of success because uh, there's obviously a lot riding on that. So you want to test multiple different scenarios, in multiple different environments. And if you think of a piece of hardware and moving that between each physical scenario or environment, it's certainly going to take a considerable amount of time and effort. And then finally, there's a lot of duplicate effort around uh, deploying to fleets of robots. And what I mean by that, and hopefully you'll be able to see this video, I'm not sure how clear it is, um, but you know, hopefully it, it sort of comes through and you, you get the idea. But this is basically a flyover of a Amazon fulfillment center in the US, a robotic fulfillment center. Uh, we've just announced that we're building one out in Western Sydney. Um, and to give you an idea of scale, this is multiple football fields big. Uh, and when you place an order on Amazon.com, uh, essentially your order finally comes to the fulfillment center where uh, it's you know, one of the products that you've ordered is potentially one of these shelving units. Uh, and what you've got is these little robots called Kiva robots. And they sort of drive around this fulfillment center, get under the shelf. Uh, that has your product that you've ordered, picks it up and then takes it to a human picker uh, that essentially takes the product out when the shelf arrives. Um, it obviously has to go through some narrow corridors and avoid other shelving units as it's, as it's navigating through the fulfillment center. Um, the human picker pulls out the product, puts it in the box and sends it to you. And then that shelf makes its way back into the field. 
Um, and so, you know, with, with this sort of scale, you're looking at quite a few Kiva robots within this one fulfillment center. And then uh, globally, we announced, I think last year, mid last year at, uh, at Amazon uh, Remars, the, the event where we uh, focus on emerging technologies, uh, we announced that we had uh, over 200,000 of these robots deployed. So if you sort of consider what's involved in deploying code to physical robots, Certainly you could do it over the air um, and that's pretty useful, but you wouldn't want to do it all in one hit because what if there's something that you missed in testing and you end up bricking 200,000 robots? Um, what if when you're pushing out the, the code, um, you know, the robot is midway through a mission uh, and then it halts to, to get uh, flashed and then it starts up again, doesn't know what it's doing. Maybe it's about to run out of battery. Um, so these are all sort of things that you want to consider when you're deploying to large fleets of robots. And so for that reason, for some of these developer challenges, um, we tend to, to focus on as robotic developers, robot simulations. Uh, this tends to be a, a good way to at least avoid the first three problems, which is around cost, uh, around safety, uh, as well as around iterative uh, testing and being able to test in multiple different scenarios. Uh, what we're able to do is create these 3D worlds in tools such as Gazebo, which is an open source robotic simulator. Uh, and we're able to build out these 3D worlds. Uh, we're able to spawn the robot into that 3D world. We're able to define the terrain as well as other objects, whether that's uh, a, a building, a room. Um, you can see in this screenshot here, we've sort of got a robot arm in front of a table with a drill and a red ball. Uh, and then off to the right, you can actually see what's called an RGBD camera. You can't really see it that well, but that's basically similar to like an Xbox Connect. Um, it's able to determine uh, not only uh, sort of, you know, view objects and determine what they are, but also the distance uh, from the camera uh, of where that object is. So we're able to build out this sort of scenario in a simulation. But then furthermore, we're able to test out things uh, related to physics, such as uh, gravity, illumination, inertia, uh, other sorts of forces. So we're able to get a, a pretty accurate simulation of how the robot might interact in the real world, but we're able to do it in a safe manner behind a, a window pane. Uh, we don't have to really spend any money to be able to spin this up. You typically do need um, some decent hardware, potentially something with a GPU, uh, to be able to get a, a fairly smooth simulation. Uh, but what we're able to do is define multiple different scenarios, uh, multiple different environments, and be able to spawn that robot into those multiple different environments and do that testing. So certainly a lot easier than you know, having to pick up a, a robot and move it between uh, different scenarios. But to better illustrate what I mean by uh, simulations, I sort of wanted to show uh, a bit of an example of uh, a real-world robot and what the simulation would look like. Uh, this real-world robot is something that I sort of put together uh, around March or April um, when we started going to lockdown um, and everyone was desperately clawing for toilet paper. Uh, I know personally I was one of those uh, one of those people who was like, yeah, it'll be fine. Yeah, we're never going to run out of toilet paper. I'll be able to find some easily. This is just a one- or two-day thing. Uh, and then the next thing I know, uh, I'm going to Coles and Woolies you know, every couple of hours, desperately looking at empty shelves. So uh, that you know, affected my ability to social distance, and I wondered how robots could potentially uh, assist with this scenario. So hopefully you're, you're going to be able to hear the audio here. Alexa, can you get me some toilet paper from the local shops? sure if you can but hopefully you heard that um, that is uh, it's an alexa enabled uh robot um so basically i asked uh alexa to find me some toilet paper uh and this is a turtle bot three um so it is a uh it's an autonomous uh, mobile device with a robot arm on it you can see a lidar spinning on there uh, on top of it and what it's doing is it's navigating, it's basically looking for toilet paper, it's discovered toilet paper, uh, specifically a toilet paper roll, it's navigated to that, that uh, toilet paper roll and it's gone ahead and done a, a pick of that. Uh, and then hopefully it, it brings it back to myself. Uh, so this was sort of my idea around being able to collect toilet paper 
um, but still adhere to social distancing methods. Um, obviously, this thing probably would not make it to the local calls or bullies without getting run over, but you can see how the it's sort of a proof of concept or a prototype of how something like that would potentially work. Um, now, with this sort of test, there's obviously a lot of different scenarios that you'd want to test it in if you were to actually get this thing in production. So you'd want to test it, you know, in, at a, you want to test it uh, for a Coles map, a Woolies map, because you're not going to have GPS in there. So you want to make sure you're able to navigate those stores appropriately. Uh, you want to make sure that it can actually get there without getting hit by a car. Um, you want to make sure it can get back without the toilet paper getting stolen. Uh, you want to make sure that it actually reaches and grasps the toilet paper correctly because it's actually quite a difficult task to get the uh, the actual robotic device to roll up um, and make sure that it's within a specific range for that arm to be able to then appropriately reach out and grasp that toilet paper without knocking it over or without missing it um, and then being able to do that within margins of error. So there's quite a few different tests that we want to do to ensure that this would work. Uh, and we want to ensure that you know, when we're making changes to the robotic code, that those tests continue to work, obviously through regression tests. Now, to be able to do something like that, what we want to do is basically define our test scenarios, uh, very similar to uh, developing a, a modern app or an application in general. So we want to define those test scenarios, which I just mentioned. We want to build a, uh, a simulation of that robot or a virtual uh, robot. Uh, we do this through what's called a universal robot description format, which is a fancy word for basically an XML file that dictates all the parts of the robot uh, and how it moves and how it operates. Uh, we want to generate a simulation world for it to be able to operate in. And then we want to accurately define those test cases uh, that we that we decided on initially. And then typically what we get after uh, a fair bit of development, so I've sort of skipped, for, uh, skipped through a lot of that, the development aspects, uh, just to sort of show how this all, um, how this all comes together. You can see here basically a simulation. So on the right hand side, uh, you've got that gazebo simulation where you can see a TurtleBot 3, same sort of device, navigating through a simulated world that's been constructed, pretty simple world. Uh, it's got some walls and a couple of obstacles. On the bottom left-hand side, you can see a map. Uh, so this is very similar to if you've got a robot vacuum cleaner, typically uh, they use what's called SLAM, uh, which is basically a mapping and navigation suite. So you can sort of drive your robot around for the first time and get to understand the world around it, build a map, and then uh, from there, it's able to use that map to navigate appropriately. And then above that, you can see what the camera can see, uh, which is on the front of the turtle bot. Um, so in this case, I've actually used a beer can instead of a, a toilet paper roll because the beer can is pretty much out of the box um, with what the open source uh, simulator is able to provide. I can be bothered building a toilet paper roll in the simulator. Uh, and then in front of it, admittedly, is a QR, similar to QR code. Uh, it's not actually recognizing the beer can, it's recognizing the QR code. Um, long story, but it provides the provides a marking ability. Now you can see in the simulator, uh, it's gone to reach out for that beer can and it's pretty much missed, it's knocked it over. Um, there's a couple of reasons for this. One is because it overshot, so either we drove too close to it, um, or we extended the arm too far, so there needs to be some modification to our code to allow it to, to properly grasp uh, that can, but also the gripper didn't open either. One of the more important factors here though is, and you may not be able to see this too accurately because I haven't really changed the, um, the angle, but the, the robot itself is actually tipping forward a little bit. And the reason for that is because the robot arm, its weight, uh, is uh, it's fully extended and the weight of the robot arm itself is causing that robot to tip over a bit. And so you can see how while this is a much smaller uh, robotic device, uh, if we were to, uh, you know, sort of think about a truck that's using a robotic arm, uh, maybe it's a one-ton truck uh, and it's used in, construct in construction or some other industrial uh, use case, it would potentially be quite disastrous to be a, to test something like this in the real world versus a simulation. Um, 
So that's something to keep in mind. Now, obviously, uh, this is just one simulation that we've tested. We'd want to test out a lot more before we put in a, uh, a robotic device into production. Um, we had to sort of sit here and watch it and work out whether it succeeded or not. And if we were to run this on a local laptop, which you know, I sort of do all the time, um, you can only run one simulation at once. And that's sort of, you know, well, for most of us that are familiar with, with cloud platforms, that's sort of where the cloud excels, being able to really scale out uh, any sort of compute or any sort of testing. And that's where AWS RoboMaker comes in, it provides a platform uh, to allow you to do a number of things. So it allows you to leverage some of those intelligent capabilities out of the cloud, like AWS Recognition or Lex, uh, to be able to build those you know, intelligent chat or uh, recognition capabilities, photo or video recognition without having to have that uh, prior machine learning experience. Um, it provides a development environment such as Cloud9. It's fully configured for that uh, robotic development experience. But then the two that we'll be focusing on mainly is around simulation and fleet management. So it provides a, a hosted uh, gazebo simulator, which is API driven and allows us to potentially run simulations in parallel uh, and be able to, to get much faster iteration through us through some of our regression tests to make sure that our robot uh, functions correctly. Uh, and then it provides a fleet management capability to manage some of those issues that I sort of discussed before. But what I want to quickly do uh, is touch on some of the items that you can potentially use to uh, you know, strap together to build out a pipeline uh, for robotic development to allow you to test. Because uh, while we did, you know, while you are able to scale out your simulations uh, and be able to test different scenarios, the last thing you want to do is be sitting there watching it, waiting for it to potentially reach out and miss that beer can. Uh, or potentially not navigate to the, the beer can appropriately. So we want to build uh, an environment, uh, uh, basically a, a test and deploy pipeline uh, to be able to do a lot of that for us. And so before I get into what that looks like, I just want to quickly touch on a couple of uh, AWS services that I'll be talking about here uh, to build out that pipeline. Um, I'm uh, fully aware that most of you are probably quite familiar with these. Um, but I'll touch on them anyway. So AWS Lambda function as a service platform or a serverless platform that allows you to essentially invoke code uh, on demand, uh, potentially event driven without having to uh, manage the underlying compute platform. Uh, we've got Pope, uh, Code Pipeline, which is a managed continuous delivery service. Um, we've got AWS Step Functions, which is basically a, a serverless uh, orchestrational workflow platform, which allows you to potentially uh, string together some of those Lambda functions. And then finally, we've got Code Build, which is uh, a managed continuous integration platform to compile our code, to be able to package it uh, ready for deployment. And so what we're going to do is use these services to basically create a pipeline that does something similar to this at a 20,000 foot overview. So for robotic developers, when they do a push uh, to a Git repo, um, it basically triggers uh, our CI CD tools, which is uh, code pipeline and code build, uh, to use the AWS SDKs to spin up a bunch of regression tests. We're going to collect the feedback from those regression tests and determine that they passed successfully before then releasing that candidate software ready for deployment to our production fleet. And so if we take a look at what, what that might look like, uh, when we're defining test scenarios uh, with AWS RoboMaker, we're typically doing it in the form of JSON. Um, and you can sort of see an example here where we've got two uh, test examples uh, where we're spinning up two different simulation environments. One is a simulated world for Coles, another one's a simulated world for Woolies. Uh, we've dictated the type of robot that we're spawning as well as the region we want to deploy it into. Uh, and one thing I will mention uh, about on this slide, it does mention a ROS application. Uh, so I, I didn't want to go into too much detail due to time constraints, but basically uh, RoboMaker uses the robot operating system. Uh, that's the sort of framework that's used for robotic development. Uh, but I won't go into too much detail about that. But what we're essentially doing uh, when we're spawning these simulations, so for instance, the Coles or the Woolies uh, simulated world, 
is we want to be able to test out uh, those simulations. We want to ensure that the turtle bot navigates to the beer can correctly and grasps it, potentially doesn't. But what we want to do is we want to determine that test as quick as possible. So as soon as that beer can gets knocked over, we want to be able to, to detect that. And we can do that in the simulator by basically saying, you know, where is the beer can at any one point? If it's you know, rolling away and not in the hand of the gripper based on its coordinates, its X, Y, Z coordinates, um, then we want to tag that simulation appropriately and say that it failed. Uh, maybe we want to put other metadata in that in those tags. So, for instance, to say you know it took thirty seconds to get to the beer can, or uh, it potentially travelled thirty meters to get there. Um, and then we want to cancel that job as soon as possible, uh, mainly because with the cloud, it's pay as you go. Uh, so obviously, we want it to run for as limited time as possible. So then we'll do a force cancel of that simulation. And we'll do this across the spectrum of our regression tests. So what we're looking at essentially is when a when code pipeline is invoked, an AWS Lambda function is invoked, uh, which then runs a simulation workflow and AWS step functions uh, that I think we lost you. You are muted. Yeah, Bobby, it sounds like your audio might have moved out. Yeah. Volume went off. That's right. We'll give Bobby a sec to rejoin. No, I can see that you're unmuted, but we can't hear you, Bobby. You using a Bluetooth headset? Just so it might have dropped out. Can you hear me right now? Yeah, we can hear you now. All right. I'm just going to yell at my laptop. Hopefully, you're still <laughs> able to hear me. Um, clearly, my Bluetooth is not working. Uh, thanks, Windows. Uh, so We can anyway. hear you loud and clear, so keep going. Awesome. All right, I'll just put away my Bluetooth headset. So, look, uh, I'm not sure how much of that you heard, but I'll quickly uh, go over that. So, Code Pipeline triggers AWS Lambda which triggers a step function. Uh, basically, we are kicking off a batch job uh, via Lambda, um, which triggers a number of simulation, uh, simulation uh, jobs. Uh, we're obviously going to tag those jobs and terminate them as soon as they're complete. Um, but what we're doing every 30 seconds uh, with AWS Lambda is that we're testing, well, we're checking to see if those jobs have completed. Once they have completed, we're grabbing the results and then we're passing them back to uh, Code Pipeline to dictate whether it's succeeded or failed. Um, so, you know, typically we're going to test, you know, we might regression test uh, 30 different simulations uh, to ensure that any change that we've made to our robotic code, uh, those tests are successful. And then to bring it all together, what we're doing, so you know, if we have a feature brand, branch, maybe I want four-ply toilet paper instead of two, and I want it to recognize four-ply on, uh, on, um, on the toilet paper at Coles or Woolies. Uh, so I'll be testing that in uh, my local environment, potentially. I'll uh, submit a pull request to the integration branch when that's merged. We'll be going through that pipeline um, process where we're doing a build of our, uh, of our code, robotic code. We're storing it in S3, and then we're pulling it down to our, into our simulation uh, to ensure that it's all working successfully. And then assuming that is, 
Uh, we then merged that into the mainline branch. Uh, once again, we are kicking off another pipeline which does a build and bundle, uh, stores it in S3, and then we're deploying to a fleet of physical robots because there are certain things uh, that you potentially want to double check in the real world before deploying to physical robots. Uh, and then from there, it's a release candidate to deploy to production robots or production fleet. So potentially hardware. And then what we're doing finally in the, this thing is, uh, won't go away, but anyway, what we're doing uh, finally when we're deploying to physical devices or physical robots, uh, we're using AWS Robomaker's fleet management capability. And this leverages, if you're familiar with AWS IoT, uh, it leverages the green grass capability. Uh, so basically there's a green grass uh, agent deployed on every uh, piece of robotic hardware and it is connected over the air. Uh, we can push out our robotic code to the robots when a flag has fallen to say that they're ready. So potentially maybe they're docked and charging uh, so that they're ready to, to go for getting an upgrade. Uh, and then we're able to push out a, uh, an update in a concurrent manner uh, to the, uh, you know, depending on a, on a percentage. So we can say 20% of the fleet should be deployed at, to, at any one time to prevent, you know, accidentally bricking an entire fleet of robots. Uh, so we can, you know, start deploying to two at a time in this fleet of 10. Uh, what we can also do is set a failure threshold. So you can see here that one's failed and we've got a failure threshold of 15. Once that failure threshold is passed, so we're at 20%, we then halt the rollout of, uh, of the code. Uh, and that's to ensure once again that, you know, we don't brick a bunch of robots and then we have to walk around with a serial cable uh, trying to fix them all uh, wherever they may be. And obviously this is pretty important. Uh, if we go back to the example of collecting toilet paper, the last thing you want is uh, a robot on its way home, it's crossing the road, stops halfway through uh, to, to get a, an update. Uh, either two things are gonna happen, either it's gonna get smashed to a thousand pieces by a car driving past, or someone's gonna steal the toilet paper. So uh, you definitely wanna make sure that it's ready to, to get that upgrade. So when we're talking about some of the benefits, obviously we've covered uh, quite a bit here around cost, safety, speed, repeatability, uh, really fast prototyping. The thing that I really like about Robomaker personally is that uh, when I first got into robotics was when Robomaker came out uh, and I did not feel comfortable purchasing hardware. Um, you know, I, I definitely didn't want to fork out money for something I wasn't sure I'd be able to do or not. Uh, so Robomaker was sort of a way of me being able to start to experiment and get an understanding and see if I could actually do it before I start forking out money. Uh, but from a business perspective, it definitely allows for a faster time to market uh, and increased feature release velocity and less software defects in production. Pretty much what we want from uh, a good um, DevOps pipeline and, and good DevOps practices. What I wanted to quickly touch on uh, just before I finish was uh, iRobot uh, specifically use uh, Robomaker in this manner. Um, and they use more or less the, the sort of architecture that I just showed uh, around being able to automate their regression testing. Um, iRobot are well known for doing things like robot vacuum cleaners, certainly from a, you know, if you're pushing out a large scale of commercial robots, you want to ensure that you've covered all scenarios. Uh, and so they basically do more than 40 automated tests on each code commit. Uh, this was at least at the end of last year anyway. Um, they announced at reInvent last year uh, and more than 500 automated tests for each release candidate. So uh, if you are interested in seeing sort of a real world use case, iRobot are doing this uh, in the real world and they talked about it at reInvent last year. Uh, the session should be up on YouTube. But look, that's it from me. Um, so that, that pretty much covers everything. If you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to me, connect on LinkedIn, or if you just want to know how to get started with uh, robotic development in general, or you like to think, uh, or you just want to reach out in general, feel free. Thanks, folks. Awesome. Thanks, Bobby. Don't so, know if we have time for questions. Uh, we totally, yeah, we, we can we can take a couple of minutes of questions. In fact, um, mid-talk, we had one from uh, from Martin. 
are asking, how do you do the branch integration uh, for feature branches? You do the branch integration, feature branches. So look, basically it's still using, um, you know, very common to, uh, I guess, software development practices in general. We're still doing things like, uh, you know, having a, a master branch, still branching uh, to create new features. Um, generally, I will say that uh, a lot of devs do prefer to work off their local environment because it's um, when we're talking about uh, building a, you know, building locally, you're generally able to run a ROS launch and be able to spin up um, your tests straight away before then, you know, determining that it, it works correctly. Uh, then committing and pushing your code and then submitting a pull request uh, into the integration branch, which then uh, kicks off that webhook to start that whole build process. If you're doing it in AWS RoboMaker, one thing to note is if you do, uh, you know, if you do bundle, sorry, if you do push your code um, or if you do bundle uh, and you want to test before pushing your code to the branch, um, you do need to bundle and push to S3 first, and then that gets pulled down into the simulation. So there's a few minutes there that you have to wait for a simulation to run to be able to test sort of locally before you then go and push that code uh, to your uh, to code commit or GitHub or, or whatever um, Git repo you're using. Uh, but yeah, from there, uh, it's simply a merge, uh, kicks off that process, assuming those tests are successful. It's another pull and merge again into master. Awesome. There's another question there from Sunil, who's just posted in the chat as well, asking about what is the accuracy of simulation uh, versus the, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that's meant to be robot rather than robot um, versus the actual one. But we can yeah, call it yeah. robot as well, like we're not one to change. Yeah, yeah. All my robots have names. So. <laughs> Look, um, it's, it's actually a good question. This is sort of, it's one of those, it's one of those constant arguments uh, back and forth between folks in the robot development community as to if simulations are accurate enough. Uh, personally, I use simulations to ensure that I'm not going to smash my robot into a thousand pieces because I've done it before um, and I'm constantly 3D printing parts because I've got the, the calculations incorrect uh, for the angles uh, of a joint angle. But what I do find it doesn't do as well personally, or if I wanted it to do it well, it would be a lot of effort in a simulation, is things like inference. Um, so being able to recognize, uh, like if we're talking about uh, a robot that needs to be able to recognize rust. If you've got a, a drone that's circling a, uh, a mining site, um, potentially an offshore oil rig, and you need to be able to recognize uh, rust around it to, to potentially repair as quick as possible. Um, to be able to recognize that rust uh, in a simulation, what you're training that machine learning model for uh, potentially won't look as realistic as in the real world. Personally, I prefer to just do that sort of testing in the real world and not in a simulation. That can get a lot more difficult if we're talking about something that's doing undersea um, inspection of cables that's going to be a lot harder to get hold of. So um, that's probably where you'd want to spend more time working on your simulation and get photorealism, which is possible. It's just a lot of extra work. So um, it, it really depends on what scenario you're aiming for as to whether you want to spend calories improving the sim or whether you've decided, right, that's enough. I'm going to push to the physical robot and test it out in the real world. I'd say there's, there's sort of a, a moving goalpost there as to when you want to make that. Awesome. Well, we might leave the questions there, but as Bobby said, if you've got any questions, feel free to follow up with him, um, you know, either through the chat here in Zoom or, uh, or reach out to him on LinkedIn. Uh, but again, thank you very much for, uh, for your talk, Bobby. It was really great. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, let's keep rolling. Uh, we've had a bunch more folks join since the beginning as well. So um, we're moving into our events section next, um, just to talk about a couple of the events that are coming up. Uh, so there's web directions, code remote. Um, so pretty much all these conferences that I'm talking about uh, are going to be remote or distributed. So um, this is all about uh, front end developers or front end development. Um, so it's an interesting format that they're doing. They're doing uh, 
three and a bit hours, uh, three uh, over over all of September. So September three, September 10, 17, and 24. Um, so it's a, it's a virtual online conference uh, around uh, yeah, front-end development. Uh, Web Directions are also doing a product-focused one for people that are, uh, that are into the product management and design side of things as well. Uh, they're doing that in November, a similar sort of format from, uh, from 4 to 7.30 p.m. Um, our time. Uh, actually, no, that's Pacific time, sorry. I'm looking at the Australian East Coast. So completely different dates from what I was looking at before. These ones here, uh, right down in the middle where it says AU East Coast. Uh, you can read. In fact, I'm going to let you all read the dates rather than me mistranslate them as we come along. Uh, but uh, Web Directions conferences in general are, uh, are really fantastic and it's interesting to see them moving all online um, this year. There's also uh, DevOps World by CloudBees, um, and that's a virtual event as well happening in September on the 22nd to 24th. Um, so they're going to make all that content available uh, online. Uh, a bunch of really interesting, uh, really interesting chunks of content that are that are coming down there as well. Uh, also, the DevOps Enterprise Summit. Uh, it says that it is in Las Vegas, but it is virtual. Uh, it's happening on October the 13th to 15th, which I guess for us is going to be like. 14th to 16th. Um, and yeah, that's going to be, uh, again, all online, uh, but definitely worth checking that out as well, particularly if you're more in sort of the executive leadership track of things. All right, so we mentioned uh, jobs earlier and, and gave people a little bit of a heads up there, but um, hopefully you've had a little bit of a time to think about that. So if you are uh, either hiring at the moment or uh, looking to be hired, um, this is your moment to shine. Um, so do we have anybody that's, uh, that's willing to pipe up and talk about a position or talk about themselves? Um, I'm actually looking for a job at the moment. Um, I'm currently studying with uh, AWS Restart. Um, I've basically got a background as a developer. Um, big interest in uh, DevOps and uh, automation. Worked a bit as a sysadmin for a while. Uh, not sysadmin, <laughs> tester, software tester. And you clearly have experience being paged. <laughs> and it's probably an automated call. <laughs> Very good. Um, and just for the folks that weren't able to pick out who's un unmuted at the moment, uh, who are you? Oh, uh, I'm Ben Sweetnam. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Ben. Uh, if anybody's got any positions that they're looking to fill at the moment, please reach out to Ben. Um, I think we've got another, another person that's looking to hire or be hired. We've got Brent. Um, thanks, uh, Brent Harrison. I work at a consultancy called Source Group. We primarily work with large enterprises, helping them move to the cloud. Um, primarily AWS, however, we do do some GCP and Azure. We're always on the lookout for consultants. So if you're interested in working in that space, reach out. I'll have my details. I'm presenting a lightning talk. I have my details there. Otherwise, uh, sourcegroup.com.au. Awesome. Thanks, Brent. Thanks. Um, Bobby, I know that AWS have got a heap of positions open at the moment, but is there uh, any, any particular one that you want to do a shout out for here? Yep. Um, I was actually going to uh, say that, but I thought maybe I've talked too much. Um, so there is a couple of positions actually within, uh, within my team. Um, so my boss is actually leaving to Germany. Um, so we are looking for an SA manager uh, as well as um one of my colleagues uh is leaving to the us which is like not a good time to be leaving to the us but uh it is what it is so yeah we we have two positions open specifically within the team that i work in which is uh around medium enterprise um so you know not too big not too small um but it does cover a wide variety of different technologies so uh if you uh, i'd say it's it's a perfect fit for those who like uh, are basically technologists. They like to be across the broad spectrum of technologies. They uh, consider themselves jack of all trades, master of none, I'd say is probably the best sort of fit. Um, you can have specialties, that's fine, but 
uh, general technologist is definitely a, a good fit for that role. Um, if you are interested, feel free to reach out to me. I will put my uh, email address in the chat um, if you didn't get it before. Uh, feel free to reach out to me directly. Happy to have a chat about that or if there's any other roles on the AWS uh, site because there are a lot and I can't remember any of them. Um, but if there are any other roles, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Happy to have a talk and, and see if, um, you know, if your profile fits or uh, if there's any info that you want as to how to you know, sort of uh, get a job at AWS. Awesome, thanks, Bobby. I, I think I saw something yesterday that uh, that Amazon are, fire, are hiring 200 plus people in Sydney. So uh, no surprises that you couldn't remember uh, all of the all the positions that are yeah. at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I run out. It's uh, but yeah, it's, look, it's a good time to to be in the industry. Good time to be at, at AWS. So yeah, feel free to reach out. Check out the uh, I think it's Amazon Jobs. Um, check it out and reach out to me. Brilliant. All right, anybody else that is looking to uh, to hire or be hired? Cool, all right, we might wrap it there. Um, for anybody that uh, that's just popped their hand up and, and uh, have done their little spiel, feel free to put something on the Meetup page as well as a comment on the Meetup and uh, people can find your details there. All right, <laughs> last up, we've got uh, our single lightning talk for this evening. We'll uh, finish nice and early tonight, which is lovely to see. We've got uh, Brent uh, talking about the AWS Global Accelerator. Over to you, Brent. Cheers, thanks, Lindsay. Um, can you see my screen? I can see and hear you just fine. Perfect. All right, uh, yeah, so today we're just doing a quick short talk on AWS Global Accelerator. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the service and also show a client use case that we recently did. But firstly, let's just do a quick refresher on Anycast because that's going to be important <laughs> for this talk. So what is Anycast? Um, you'll, you will be very familiar with Unicast, so where you have one IP and that refers to a server. Anycast is one IP to one of multiple servers, right? So I've got two diagrams there on the right. Uh, request to an Anycast IP will be directed to the closest server on the network. Um, that's achieved by using uh, BGP, and it's calculated based on number of hops. And you can kind of see that on the right there in the bottom diagram where the server is going to the server closest to it. That is broadcasted, broadcasting that address. This provides uh, several benefits. Uh, we can decrease latency by serving content from the closest node to the client. Uh, it provides load balancing. Uh, we can improve reliability uh, and it can reduce the impact of DDoS attacks. If we're serving, if it's a distributed attack, uh, it will be serving two nodes closest to them so it won't have one server being overloaded with that flood. So what does this have to do with Global Accelerator? Well, Global Accelerator is essentially an AWS Anycast service. It also does some more. Um, I didn't want to just say it was an Anycast service in case Bobby got angry at me. Um, what it does is it provides you with static public IPs. Or it also uh, supports bring your own IP. AWS will advertise those IPs from the edge of the AWS global network which will minimize the amount of last mile between your user and your application. So they will go to a node on the edge of the AWS global network and then transit via the AWS network to get to your workloads in whatever region they may be. Um, as of date, they have 83 points of presence in 73 cities across 38 countries, uh, which means that there's a good chance that there is gonna be a local point of presence to your users. The Global Accelerator itself supports backends, including application load balancers, network load balancers, and EC2 instances. Um, and it definitely simplifies multi-region deployments um, with less than one minute failover of traffic to a healthy endpoint. 
And because, you know, I recently got the NBN, I love nothing more than a speed test tool. Um, and this one provides yet another one. If you go to that link there, speedtest.globalaccelerator.aws, it will give you a comparison of how traffic would be routed across AWS from a latency point of view, um, how it would be routed across AWS's network versus bouncing around the public internet. So that could be some useful metrics when determining whether this service would improve your, your end user's experience. Um, on the diagram on the right here, you can show, it shows uh, some users, they resolve an IP to an Amazon Edge location, uh, and then there's AWS Global Accelerator, which is directing traffic um, between two regions, the EU East one and EU Central one. Uh, and this was derived from an actual use case that uh, Amazon has made public. All right. So talking about how I've actually used this service, uh, I recently had a client where the Apex domain was not in Route 53, right? Um, they had a very traditional load balancer on-prem and all it was doing was performing 301 redirections. So what I mean by that is example.com, they were redirecting it to www.example.com. They had DNS um, on-premise on a bind server uh, but we wanted to use the a an ALB, an application load balancer, to perform the Apex domain, uh, sorry, I've got a spelling error there, Apex domain redirections without migrating DNS. Um, for those of you that are a bit more familiar with DNS, you can't see name an Apex record to another record without breaking a bunch of stuff. Um, so, and also to note, using a static IP with an ALB, um, there is a pattern for doing it, but it's quite complicated and it can be a bit fragile. Um, however, it is quite simple to achieve this with AWS Global Accelerator. And this is essentially what we delivered. Quite simple, actually. Uh, we added a, a record to the on-prem BIM service uh, that resolved to AWS's uh, Global Accelerator Anycast IPs. Uh, the Global Accelerator had a listener configuration to direct traffic to the ALB, and the ALBs were doing redirections via listener, listener configuration. Benefit of this was it was extremely quick to deploy, um, also serverless, which was good, no service to manage. Um, it's quite cost effective and it will be extensible. So if uh, they want to spin up additional regions and balance things and deliver things closer to the users. This is definitely the service to go with. Uh, the other, other benefit here was I didn't have to work on doing a migration from an on-premise bind server into Route 53 where I'd be able to use an alias record um, to point an application load balancer. So that was very much a quick talk on AWS Global Accelerator. Uh, are there any questions? All right. Well, in lieu of questions, thank you very much, Brent. No problem. Awesome. And if you're uh, too uh, too shy to speak up, feel free to follow up with Brent uh, after the meetup. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer your questions. All right. In uh, the last stretch here, uh, thank you very much for coming. Just a quick heads up for next month, uh, our meetup. We've got two main talks scheduled. Uh, we've got Terraform CDK. Uh, so talking about the cloud development kit, which we had a talk on last month, uh, and we're applying that uh, outside of AWS uh, with Terraform, which is going to be super interesting to see. And uh, we've also got uh, a talk about working in a cloud IDE instead of having local uh, development environments. So uh, both of those are bound to be super interesting and uh, hope you're able to join us next month. Thank you for coming and uh, have a happy and safe uh, rest of August and into September. And see you next month. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks all.